Good morning. If you have a Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be in verses 6 and 7 that Aubrey just read for us. As you're turning there, if you're new, uh, welcome. My name is Jamin. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we are thrilled that you're worshiping with us. If you're watching online, uh, wherever you are, thank you for joining us. Um, We are in the middle of a series called In Christ, and in Christ is a phrase you find all over the New Testament, and it captures the very heart of what it means Uh, to be a Christian, to be united to Jesus by faith means that we're united to who he is, to what he's done, and to the the people that he uh, is the head of. And so really what, what we're doing now is we're finding passages in the New Testament that have the in Christ language in them or that teach union with Christ. And we're considering three things about these passages, a truth to embrace in Christ, a lie to renounce through Christ and a step to take with Christ. And in Ephesians 4, verse 7, we find the in Christ language in this verse. It sounds like this. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds, where? In Christ Jesus. So here's what it's saying. It's really beautiful. In Christ, we have access to this protective peace of God, the word guard is a, is a military word. In, in Greek, it's used to describe a, a Roman garrison. And so what it's saying is, is that God's peace will operate like an army uh, around your heart and will protect your heart and your mind from anything that threatens peace. So here's the truth to embrace right out of the passage. God's peace protects your heart and your mind in Christ. Uh, protects it from What? Well, verse 6 tells us, maybe this verse caught your attention. It's incredibly relevant. Do not be anxious about anything. Um, I I don't know about you. I read uh, that verse and I think, oh, we just can't mean what it says. Don't be anxious about anything. You know what the word anything means in Greek? Anything. It means what it says. And so a verse like this, that's so all-encompassing. Don't be anxious about anything. Doesn't it make you a little bit anxious? In my 20s, if you had asked me, hey, what Bible verses make you feel like you still have a long way to go in your relationship with God? I'd have talked about Bible verses about maybe general holiness or sexual purity or loving your enemies or being wise with your words. And all of those still ring true. But if you ask me in my late 30s where I am now, what Bible verses make you feel like you still have a long way to go in your relationship with God, it's this one. Do not be anxious about anything. I find that really difficult. I, uh, one author said that anxiety is the inability to turn off your mind, and I just don't think my mind came with an off switch in it anywhere. I am, it's running, it's constantly running. And in it running, I can be anxious about my children, and I can be anxious about this church, and I can be anxious about relationships, and I can be anxious about the Dallas Cowboys, they have a big game today, and I can be anxious about being anxious. All that to say, I'm I'm preaching this sermon as a person who falls short of its command. Uh, I, I also am preaching this sermon to a people who are living right in the middle of a well-documented, often talked about mental health crisis. And the tip of the spear of that crisis is anxiety in the statistics around anxiety. Uh, In 2019, somebody wrote an article looking at all the mental health trends and the comment they made was, it's as if the entire country is right in the middle of a panic attack. In 2018, 55% of people said they felt stressed most of the day. In 2019, 39% of people said that they were more worried than they were in 2018. And then 2020 came and brought a pandemic and social chaos, political chaos. And that didn't create the trends. It didn't create the crisis, but it definitely accelerated it. It was like fuel on a fire. And we talked about this before, but with where we live right now, with all the access we have to technology, we are inundated with information, we are inundated with news, and the people behind all of that knows that the news and the information that gets the most clicks are the things that feed fear and worry. 
And so where that leaves us is it leaves us a people who are over-informed about problems that we have very little control over. So things are not trending towards us being a less anxious, more at peace people. And I'm not assuming that everyone in here is part of the statistics. I don't want, as, as an anxious person, I don't want to just assume that my anxiety is shared by everyone else. But I imagine that many in the room, you have some sort of relationship with anxiety. You have some sort of experience of anxiety. And maybe you'd say, I function in it. It's manageable. Maybe you'd say, I'm crippled by it. It's paralyzing. Maybe you'd say it's something that is new. I haven't really struggled with it before, but lately I have. Maybe you'd say it has marked my whole life. So here is an anxious pastor preaching to an anxious people. In the verse that I'm preaching, part of it says, do not be anxious about anything. Um, I was helped this week. In light of that, I was helped this week by remembering who these words were first written to. They were written to Christians in Philippi. And do you know why they had to be told, do not be anxious? Because they were anxious. Here's what their life was like. Imagine being a Christian in a Roman city, a Roman colony. Your city is filled with people who are zealously loyal to Caesar, are willing to fight for Caesar, willing to die for Caesar. And here's what they believe about Caesar. They believe he's Lord. They believe he's the Son of God. Some call him Savior. And you're a Christian, and you're living in that city, and you believe Jesus is Lord, which means Caesar's not. And the church is growing, and the message of Jesus is gaining ground, which means there's trouble brewing between the city and the church. Persecution is beginning. And, and at any moment, without restraint, the city soldiers could decide to put an end to you and your Christian community. And so you live in that threat. Then your church gets a letter from Paul. Paul started your church. He is your spiritual father. He's writing from a Roman prison. He talks about all the suffering he's endured. He starts talking about how he might die soon, and that would be gain because he gets to be with Jesus. In chapter 3, it literally says, look out for dogs, evildoers, those who mutilate the flesh. He's talking about false teachers that are threatening the church. And then towards the end of the letter, do not be anxious about anything. Your city is hostile to the gospel, could decide to end you and your church. Your spiritual father is in prison, and he may not make it out alive. There are people who are so deceived that they're called evil flesh-mutilating dogs, which sounds like something from Stranger Things, and also don't be anxious about any of that. Soldiers, suffering, imprisonment, religious enemies, death. Don't be anxious. The people who first heard these verses heard them as a people who had much to be anxious about. It's not written to people who have less reason to be anxious than we do. If anything, it's written to people who's... Uh, the threats facing them are more serious than the things that I often worry about. To a people living in the midst of very real threats, God's word says, even in that kind of circumstance, even in that kind of circumstance, there is a way in Christ to be protected by the peace of God, to have God's peace guard against anxiety. And if that's true for them, that's true for us, even and especially if we fall short of the command. So here's the truth to embrace. God's peace protects your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. We need to spend some time understanding what the Bible means when it says do not be anxious, uh, what it doesn't mean, and what it does mean. If you were to read the whole letter of Philippians, when you got to chapter 2, verse 28, here's what you would read Paul say. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less what? Anxious. Here's what happened. Uh, the church in Philippi uh, sent a guy named Epaphroditus to find Paul to give Paul money from the church. Epaphroditus got really sick. He almost died. The people in Philippi found out that he was really sick and almost died. And what Paul's saying is, I was really worried about all that. And so the guy who brings the letter to the church is most likely Epaphroditus, and Paul is writing and saying, I sent him back to you, not because he failed, not because I didn't like him, but I sent him back to you that you may rejoice at seeing him again and that I may be less anxious. How can the guy who says, I am anxious, write a chapter later and say, don't be anxious about anything? Because it's describing two different things. This is really important. 
He's saying, I have been concerned about this guy and about you in a righteous way. There's been a righteous kind of fear for his well-being. He wants good things for him. He was concerned about that. Think with me about Jesus in the garden and what described everything that he went through in the garden. He is crying and praying and sweating and bleeding, and he is dreading what is to come. He's dreading what is to come so much so that he prays and he asks God, if there's any other way, if this cup could pass from me, what words would you use to describe Jesus in that? Deeply troubled, full of concern. And all of that's just so very human. And if Jesus never sinned, which he never did, then there's a way for him to do all of that and feel all of those things in a, in a righteous way. Hear this. The opposite of anxiety is not apathy. When the Bible says things like, do not be anxious, it's not saying, stop caring about your life. It's not saying, don't be troubled by the things that are troubling. Don't be concerned. There are so many things in life that are worth being concerned about. Some of you are going through things right now in life that are deeply painful and concerning and troubling, and so much of your thought and emotion are going towards those things. And there is a good and right way to be concerned. You, as a Christian, you should be concerned about those who are suffering. You should be concerned about those who don't know Jesus. We should have a kind of concern as parents for our kids and concern for relationships. And if Paul got to be anxious in chapter 2 in a way that was not hypocritical with chapter 4, then chapter 4 can't be calling all Christians to just be happy Stoics, right? Okay, what is it then? The kind of anxiety that the Bible calls out. The, the kind of anxiety that the Bible will call us out of, rather, in verses like this is when concern has exceeded our control to the point where we are controlled by our concern. Concern has exceeded our control and we are operating controlled by those concerns. So when Jesus says in Matthew 6, don't be anxious about tomorrow, what you will eat and drink, he's not saying don't care about your basic needs. He'll call, in his teaching, he calls his disciples to help meet other people's basic needs because those things matter. What he's saying is, you can't live tomorrow while you're in today. You can't control that, so don't be controlled by it. To the Philippians, if they're sitting in their house church and they're worried that a soldier could kick down the door and arrest all of them and, and, and persecute the Christians, that's worth being concerned about. That's worth praying to God and asking that that never happens. But if all you can think about if all of your thoughts, if you're in this regular state of waiting for doors to get kicked in, waiting for something bad to happen, then you're anxious. And the Bible writes and says, don't let anything control you like that. I spent a year at Baylor University. Any Baylor Bears? Okay, yeah, praise God. Uh, I was unsure about what God wanted me to do with my life, and so I went to Baylor. I thought I was going to get a business degree and, and go into sales. Uh, my freshman year, I took a class in the business school, and it was really hard. The professor was a bit of a legend at the school, and part of his legend was how hard the class was. He would, to give you an example, he would randomly give out pop quizzes on the Wall Street Journal. And so you never knew when they were going to come, and if you wanted to do well, that means you had to not just read the Wall Street Journal every day, but study it every day. And um, the way, if there was going to be a quiz, he would not stand at the front of the class and announce that there was going to be a quiz. Instead, before he walked out into the class, he would play the Darth Vader music from Star Wars. It's, do you know the music? It's called the Imperial Death March. That's what the name of the music. You've seen Star Wars? Yeah? At least the good ones? Okay. Um, in the music, or in the movies, the Darth Vader music, the Imperial Death March, it always plays right before what? right before Vader walks into the scene. And so it's this ominous music. It's this threatening music. And it's this sound that plays and says evil is on its way, right? So he plays that in class to tell everyone that something ominous and threatening is about to happen in the form of a quiz that everyone was going to fail, right? About halfway through the semester, I'm sitting with a friend. And we're in class. We're waiting for it to start. And he turned to me and he says, I hear the Vader music every time I walk in this room. And I said, I was like, it's not, it's not playing. And he said, I know, 
but I still hear it. We've talked about this before, but that's anxiety. I hear the ominous music, even when it's not playing. The music of my heart and my mind is saying, something threatening is coming. You are about to fail something. Be prepared because evil is on its way. Something bad is about to happen. And what ends up happening is what surrounds my heart and mind is not the peace of God, but these ominous sounds of dread. And I live in that. And that music plays around our health, this anxiety around sickness and death. Something bad's going to happen. The music plays around relationships. We're anxious about upsetting people or not pleasing everyone. I'm going to fail. The music plays around our children, what could happen to them, what they will do, who they will become. The music plays around money and job. Those things offer a sense of security and that what happens if or when those things are insecure. And the music plays just around the future in general just around all that is unknown and the uncertainty of it and where is life headed. And what happens is the climate of the heart just begins to be inundated with and bombarded by these sounds of dread. Evil is coming. Something bad is right around the corner. There's a good and right way to be concerned about children and job and relationships and health and money and job. But there comes a point where we are only and always concerned, and that concern has grown beyond what we can control, and that concern has begun controlling us. And that's the thing the Bible means when it says, don't be anxious like that. Sometimes the threat is to things that's real, and and we worry, um, we think that the more that we worry whenever there are real threats, the more that we can actually protect ourselves, which is is not true. Sometimes, though, the music plays when there's no threat and may never be a threat. Mark Twain has this great quote. He says, worry is interest paid on a debt you may never owe. So I'm anxious. The ominous music plays around possibilities that may never even be realities. So this is the thing the Bible has in mind when it says be anxious for nothing. It's don't be controlled like this by anxious thoughts and anxious feelings. Don't surrender to the music. Here's a lie to renounce through Christ. I'm going to say it. It might sound like it doesn't connect, but then I'll explain why I think it matters. The lie to renounce is the peace of God leads to ease of life. Meaning when I hear the peace of God, what I equate that with is a life of ease. One of the things that uniquely contributes to the anxiety that we experience right now as a culture, um, and this is, not, this is not just what Christians are saying, this is what, what non-Christians are saying as well. They're looking at our culture and they're saying something, has, something is happening that's contributing to all of the mental health crisis. And one of the things that's happening is there is this deeply embedded narrative in the culture that life should be free of pain and life should largely go according to plan. One social psychologist termed it the utopia complex. And he defines it this way, that we are destined for and entitled to a life of positive outcomes. David Brooks, he's a journalist and an author, and he cites a study in one of his articles that says 96% of 18 to 29 year olds agree with the statement, I am certain that someday I will get where I wanna be in life. I am certain that someday I will get where I wanna be in life. And 96% of 18 to 29 year olds read that and say, oh yeah, for sure. And what does that kind of view of life, I am destined for and entitled to positive outcomes, getting where I want, life will go according to plan. What does that make no room for? Pain, disappointment, a career that never pans out, a marriage that dissolves, a body that won't get healthy, a body that won't stay healthy, any number of things that you would look at and point to and say, this wasn't part of the plan. These aren't positive outcomes. So here's what's happening. We are starting as a culture, to make up new words to describe the anxiety we feel whenever life isn't utopia. People in their 30s experience what one author called thrysis. 
It's the crisis in your 30s that happens when you, quote, climb the ladder of success and discover it's leaning against the wrong wall. There's another term I read called cuspiety. It's the anxiety people in their 50s and 60s experience when they're in the cusp ages of life and they're struggling with regret and disappointment in what was or what wasn't. I read an article this week that talked about graduation anxiety and it describes the fear of future, the fear of failure for those who are about to graduate or who have already graduated and don't know what to do with their life. See this, a culture who has bought into a story where I am entitled to a life of positive outcomes, a life that goes according to plan, becomes a culture that has to make up new words to describe the anxiety we feel when life doesn't go according to plan or when life has more painful outcomes than positive ones. Look look right at me. Here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that if you are anxious, you are anxious because you thought life would be easy, and it's not. I'm not saying that. I think it would be good and right for us to consider, though, as Christians, that there is a version of that cultural narrative that has been smuggled into Christianity. And, and there are, uh, there's a version of that narrative that's being preached by Christian preachers where we believe life with God means that God will protect us from all pain and disappointment. God will help us pain-proof our life. And you can find books and you can find sermons that'll say, if you just have more faith, then you'll have less pain. And then when pain or disappointment comes, it has a way of turning down the voice of God and turning up the ominous music. And it can come out of our lives in all kinds of confusing, anxiety-raising ways. You know know what I've learned about me and my anxiety? Is that oftentimes my anxiety is connected to this belief that I hold that's not true. And it's this belief that life will be as painless as I am faithful. So the outcome of obedience is this easy life, or at least the outcome of obedience is a life that's free of things that I most fear. And you know what happens then? When anything goes wrong, I just assume I did something wrong. If the ominous music in my head had lyrics, it would be one line on repeat. It's my fault. It's my fault. It's my fault. Think about that, friends. How often when things are not going your way do you think, what did I do wrong? Did I upset God? Or how often maybe does that turn to blame of other people? You get hypercritical of the people in your life who you think should help you make your life easier than it is. I blame myself, I blame others, and my question is this, where did we get the idea that faithfulness leads to ease of life? Jesus was faithful, and faithfulness led him into pain, not away from pain. What if part of the anxiety we experience is because we are expecting of God to deliver on promises that he never made? And when life doesn't go well, we're looking around and we're anxious because we don't know who to blame. Here's why this is important, because what God says is not. God does not say Don't listen to the ominous music because what you fear will never happen if you have enough faith. What God says is don't be controlled by anxiety because even if it happens, you will still be okay because I will still be with you. That's what the peace of God is. It's not the promise to make life easy or that life will go according to plan. It's a promise that you and your life are held secure at all times by a good God who is sovereign over all things. The peace of God, look at the verse again with me, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. See this. Whose peace is it? Uh, The peace of Jamin. No, that's my name. I'm Jamin. Uh, The peace of God. God possesses it. It's It's inviting us to peer into the very heart of God, the very climate of the heart of God. What do we see? God's never wringing his hands. God's never biting his nails. The idea is that it surpasses all understanding means it's beyond us. Paul uses this word surpasses, understanding that phrase, to describe something else in Ephesians. May have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Here's what it's saying about the very heart of God. There is love 
in God that surpasses understanding, and there is peace in God that surpasses understanding. When the human mind reaches its limits, God keeps going beyond what we can comprehend. What does God have more and more and more of within himself? Love and peace. That peace guards our hearts. Where? In Christ. This is a really important distinction. We have access to the peace of God because we are at peace with God. The peace of God is only available to those who are at peace with God. Outside of Jesus, we have huge problems. Nowhere to go with our sin. No confidence in facing what we fear. No hope at the prospect of death. But when we trust Jesus, when we are united, when we are in him, when we are united to him by faith and who he is and what he's done, all of that changes. In Christ, we've been forgiven, reconciled to God. In Christ, we have grace for our past and love and our present and hope for our future. And in Christ, we not only have the God that we're at peace with, but verse 9 is going to say the God of peace will be with you. So we are at peace with God and the God of peace is with us in Christ. That's what we have access to. Part of what this is inviting us into is is it's inviting us when we're feeling anxious to consider how God thinks about the thing that we're anxious about. It's inviting us to consider how does God feel about the thing that we feel anxious about. Wednesday night, it stormed, rained pretty hard, and the wind was pretty bad, and it thundered a lot. And I've got a a five-year-old little girl. She's our youngest, and she's really scared of storms. Her name's Ayla. And she heard the thunder, and she went and she hid in her room. And I have a 10-year-old daughter. uh, Her name is Adeline, and she's a very sweet sister. And she went in there with her to comfort her. And uh, they're in there together. And I was watching a game, so I wasn't going to mess with it. But I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, She went in there to comfort her. And so I, I went in there to check on them, and when I walked in the room, uh, Ayla is sitting in the corner of her room with her hands covering her eyes like this, and Addie is sitting next to her, comforting her and talking to her. And when I walked in the room, Addie said to Ayla, look, dad's not scared, which I wasn't. I I knew it was just wind and rain, and I was actually really happy it was raining. I've reached that age in life where I'm like, man, the grass needs this, you know? (laughs) I walk in. Ayla's covering her eyes. And Addie says, look, dad's not scared. Uncover your eyes and look at dad. And what she's doing is she's trying to get her sister to see that dad is not afraid, thinking that if she sees that dad's not afraid, then that'll help her not be afraid. Because at five, that's an age where kids still believe that dad actually knows more than they know. And dad's the one who takes care of us, and dad's arms are strong enough to throw us in the air, and comfort us and protect us, and if he's not scared and he's strong, and if he's not scared and he knows more than I know, then maybe we'll be okay. Look, dad's not scared. God is in sovereign control over all things. He knows all things. He sees all things. Psalm 103 says he established his throne in the heaven and his kingdom rules over all. Psalm 93.3 says, stronger than wild sea storms, mightier than sea storm breakers, mighty God rules from high heaven. Hebrews 1 says about Jesus, he upholds all things by the word of his power. Colossians 1 says about Jesus, everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things are created by him and through him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. In Revelation 19, John sees the end of the story, how all of this culminates. He says, then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Look, God's not scared. God's not scared. He does not feel the same way about the things that we're worried about and anxious about. 
And if he, if he knows more than we know, and if his arms are strong, and if he sees all, and he's sovereign over all, and he's promised to be with us and to only and always be working good for us, and if he's not scared, and if he's filled with love and peace that keeps going past the limits of our thoughts and feelings, then we will be okay. You will be okay. And as the ominous music plays around your health and around your relationships and around children and around jobs and around money and around future and anxiety would have us cover our eyes in the corner of the room, God's word says, look, look to God. He's not scared. And it doesn't mean there's no room for grief. And it doesn't mean there's no room for righteous concern. And it doesn't mean there's no room for wisdom in response to scary things. And it doesn't even mean that there's no room for the kinds of prayers that David prays when he says, how long, O Lord? It does mean make room for God's peace to guard your heart and your mind in all of that. That the closest thing to your heart and mind is not the ominous music, but the closest thing to your heart is the reality of a non-anxious, never afraid, almighty God who has promised in Christ that your worst case scenario in life is resurrection and eternal joy in the presence of a God who loves you so much he made peace with you by giving his own life. God is not scared. You will be okay. Hey, Jamin... How do I do all that? <laughs> I want that. I want to believe that. I, I want the ominous music to turn down. I want to make room for God's peace. How do I do that? Here's a step to take with Christ. Straight from the verse. Pray honest, grateful prayers. When you're anxious, pray honest, grateful prayers. Do not be anxious about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. See something? There's a role that we play in this. Um, you are at peace with God at all times. Never changes. In Christ, you're at peace with God. But the degree to which we experience the peace of God is affected by where we go with our anxiety. Peace with God is fixed, it's secure in Christ. The experience of the peace of God is fluid and it's connected to where we go with our anxiety. You see it here. It's, it's a do not command, do not be anxious, and then it's a do this command. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. It's going to invite us to respond to our anxiety by praying honest, grateful prayers. Now here's what I need, here's what I know that I need you to know that I know. Uh, anxiety is a really complicated thing. It's a really complex thing. Um, you can take two people who uh, have anxiety in their life and it's just two different stories, two different relationships to anxiety. Some people are anxious because of sin committed against them and it's not their fault. And they need healing. Some people are anxious because of the kind of suffering of the mind that, that they can trace into their family lineage and they were born with a certain physiological reality that makes anxiety just more present for them. So it's not the case that if everyone just prayed more, their anxiety would go away. I'm not saying that. Uh, I know some people will live faithfully with anxiety their entire life. I know some people need different kinds of help than others. Some people need medical help. Some people need the common grace of medicine, and there should be no stigma around that. There is space for that. Do not feel shame about that. While some people will need different kinds of help in this, hear me, no one needs less than Jesus. No one. And here's what God invites all of, regardless of the complexity of the stories in the room, what God invites all of us into in our anxiety is to talk to him about it by praying honest, grateful prayers. It says this, in everything, in everything, it's a, it's a juxtaposition. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything. It does not say only around major life things. It doesn't say do not be anxious. Instead, uh, with super spiritual words, pray very Christian sounding prayers that you don't even mean. It doesn't say don't be anxious. Instead, when you feel really close to God and you're really confident that he wants to hear from you. It doesn't say that. It says in everything, bring it to God with honesty. Oh, friends, Here's the invitation, to believe that every anxious thought 
is a thought that God cares about and wants you to talk to him about. It's an invitation into honest conversation with God. Often what we do with our anxious thoughts is we judge them. Uh, We decide whether they're big enough for God or too small a thing for God. What if it's not about whether the anxious thoughts are big enough or small enough, but God is simply good enough and loves you enough to want you to bring it all to him? The other option is just to, to talk to yourself about it to just stay in your own head about it. And my experience is that that just never goes anywhere productive. It doesn't, and it doesn't actually prepare me to face what I fear. Worry does not produce character. Anxiety like this does not prepare us to endure what we fear if it does happen. I have known a lot of people who have gone through tragedy and pain and heartbreaking suffering and have been faithful and even have been at peace in that circumstance. And when I ask how, they're in the room, and when I ask how, I have never heard them say, well, I was always really anxious that this would happen and I worried myself into being ready for it. Like all of my anxiety has prepared me well to face the thing that I fear. I've never heard that. I have heard hearts that trust God. I've heard hearts that talk to God that are honest with God. There is a kind of thought life that makes us ill-equipped to face life, and then there is a kind of prayer life that forms us into the kind of people who are guarded by God's peace no matter what happens in life. And that prayer life, according to the Bible, is the one who talks to God about everything, everything, brings all of our anxieties, big or small, dressed up or stripped down, full of faith or riddled with doubt, and says, God, you are not scared I am anxious and you want to hear about it. Honest prayers, grateful prayers. It says, with thanksgiving. Verse eight fills this in more. It says, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's lovely, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Here's the idea. Life, your life is filled with goodness and beauty. And when you see it, Thank God for it. And when you see it, and when you see the beauty and goodness in your life, and when that beauty and goodness turns into prayer or turns into worship, and you give thanks to God for it, anxiety loses power. So it's not saying thank God in advance because you know he's going to answer the way you want. Sometimes my kids, they'll ask for things, and before I answer, they'll say, thanks, Dad. So like, Dad, can I have another Oreo? Thanks, Dad. And they'll grab an Oreo and run out of the room, which makes me anxious. Um, That's not what this is. It's this deep-seated belief about God and life that no matter what's going on, no matter what my anxiety is in response to, there is always, at all times, something to be grateful for. And the act of thanking God has a way of reminding the heart that there is goodness and beauty in my life right now. Paul writes from a Roman prison under the threat of death, and he starts his letter this way. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. His life is not easy. He is sharing in the sufferings of Christ. There's a soldier outside the cell. There's a chance he never makes it out alive. Surely he's scared. Surely he's anxious. But he says, in the middle of all of that, he says, you know what there is in my life? There is a people I love in Philippi. At a church I started, they're generous, they're kind, they love Jesus, and so when I pray and make my request known to God, I also thank God for them. When you bring your anxiety to God, bring with you what you're thankful for. Nothing threatens peace like anxiety. Nothing threatens anxiety like gratitude. Gratitude is the posture of a people who believe that the life that they're living, the very life that they're living, is a gift from God. It reminded me of a quote from a Presbyterian pastor named Frederick Beekner. He says this, listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery it is. In the boredom and pain of it, no less than the excitement and gladness, touch, taste, smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it. Because in the last analysis, all moments are key moments and life itself is grace. Life is a gift. It's filled with grace. And when we make our requests known to God, we also bring with him our gratitude, our thanks for all of the many ways that he has still shown his goodness and beauty to us. God's peace 
protects your heart and mind in Christ. And how we access that, how we welcome God's peace like an army so close to our heart and mind that it protects us is by praying honest, grateful prayers so that his peace would come and would drown out the noise. Let's do that together. Would you pray with me? I just want to give us some space, maybe five minutes or so here to to put this into practice. Uh, And and here's what I don't think. I don't think that, um, I don't think that five minutes is going to be some sort of a, a switch that you flip and it all goes away. But I do think that for some of us, the next five minutes could be the beginning of a new way. of dealing with our anxiety. And so here's, here's what I'd ask, friend, just right where you are. Would you accept God's invitation to pray honest, grateful prayers? And would you start just by telling him right now what you're anxious about? He knows. Just name it to him. God, this is what worries me. This is what I'm afraid of. This is the concern that has control over my life. Would you tell him? And then not because he needs to hear it, but because you need to say it, would you just tell him, God, you're not scared about that. And so maybe the request is, God, would you help me trust you Maybe there's nothing wrong with asking God to fix things that are broken. There's nothing wrong to ask God to heal things that need healing. Make your requests known. And then would you, friends, uh, and if there's any part of you that thinks that I might be talking to everyone else except for you, Would you hear this? Would you thank God for something in your life? Thank him for beauty. Thank him for grace. Thank him for an encouraging friend. Thank him for part of his creation that always reminds you of God's presence. I don't know what it is, but would you find something about your life that you can turn into gratitude and thanksgiving to a God who has given you this life as a gift. Lord, we love you. Uh, One day, Jesus, you return and your shalom covers all of the earth, unites heaven and earth. And any and all anxiety and worry will give way to celebration and joy. That's coming for us, God. Help us to remember, Lord, that you are already, that you see it, that you know it, that you're in control. Nobody wrings their hands in heaven, God. And you are a God who is at complete, perfect peace, peace and love that keeps going after 
we reach our limits of understanding. So help us. Lord, some of the room are, are, are faithfully, God, putting in the work, being obedient, praying honest, grateful prayers. And even in all that, Lord, they would love for you to heal their minds. Would you do that, God? Would you just do something supernatural that touches anxious places, Lord, and leaves forever your peace, God? There are some, Lord, who are anxious and they don't know it, and their anxiety has been coming out, God, in all kinds of symptoms, and what you're inviting them into this morning is you're giving them a name for it and then giving them steps to take that might welcome you in, Lord. Oh, God, that your peace like an army would invade our souls. Protect us. Keep us. We love you. We thank you. Amen.